Hey everyone, in this video we'll be visualizing how a neural network classifies a set of data. Technically, this is a part 2 in my series on visualizing deep learning, but this video doesn't require you to watch the previous one. Either way, let's do a short recap. In the last video, we explored the idea of an artificial neural network. First, we discussed the idea of a perceptron, a sort of switch that takes in any number of inputs and turns on or off based on these inputs. For instance, we can use a perceptron to evaluate how good the weather is for outdoor activity. The perceptron can turn on when we have high humidity and high temperature. They follow the formula y hat is equal to h of w x plus b, where x is the input vector, w is the weight matrix, b is the bias vector, and h is the Heaviside step function. A perceptron is a type of artificial neuron which replaces the Heaviside step function with any function, called the activation function. A couple examples of activation functions are the sigmoid function, or the rectify the linear unit, or ELU. This gave us a nice way to linearly separate data, but the problem lies when we're trying to model a complicated data set. We found that when we layer artificial neurons together, the nonlinearity of the activation functions adds up, and we can model complicated decision boundaries. Towards the end, I showed you what happens to a bunch of points as they're being passed through a 222 neural network and a 232 neural network. One of the key things to notice is that these neural networks have randomized weights and biases. They were simply for illustration. So in this video, we're going to be looking at how a neural network classifies a set of data. Consider this data set of five distinct spirals. The goal is to determine which of the five branches a given x and y coordinate belong to. For the curious, these are the parametric equations used to generate these spirals. Capital K is the number of spirals, and lowercase k goes from 1 to capital K, which represents the kth spiral. All these points constitute our training data. The neural network will learn from the training data and be able to predict new points into these spirals. We'll talk about how the training process works in the next video. Let's take a look at one point from our training data. Here, x represents the input, an x and y coordinate, and y represents the labeled output, a number from 1 through 5, classifying each point into one of the five spirals. Let's talk about the structure of the neural network we'll be using. The input space is two-dimensional, an x and y coordinate, so the input layer has two neurons. The output space is a classification into five different spirals, so the output layer has five neurons numbered 1 through 5. If you remember, I mentioned in part 1 that the hidden layers are somewhat arbitrarily chosen, so for now let's just add one hidden layer with 100 neurons. Remember, a neural network is essentially a series of transformations which we can write out as matrix multiplications. It's written as the weight matrix times the input plus a bias passed through the activation function. For the hidden layers, let's use ReLU. But for the final layer, I'm going to introduce a new activation function, softmax. If you recall, the idea behind sigmoid was to smoothen out the Heaviside step function. This allowed us for a range of inputs or a probability. Smoothing out this function also allowed for differentiability, which will be important when we talk about training a neural network. Going back to our final layer, we typically assign the output of an x and y coordinate to be the maximum value of the five neurons. This is called argmax. Notice the arg means that instead of outputting the maximum value itself, we're outputting the index of the maximum value. Consider a vector of 25 randomly chosen points. Notice, the two highest points barely differ in value. When I apply argmax to this dataset, it only signals out the highest value. Quick side note, another way to think about applying argmax is to consider an array of values with 1 at the index at the highest value, and 0 at every other index. This is in contrast to outputting the index itself, which would be 3 in this case. Like the Heaviside step function, argmax diminishes the second highest value to zero, which was quite close to the original highest value. Soft argmax is essentially a smoothed out version of the argmax function. 
This function is typically called softmax, but it is not a soft version of the max function, but rather a soft version of argmax. Notice, softmax takes in a vector of n elements as an input, and outputs a probability vector of n elements as an output. Given that the outputs of softmax are probabilities, this also means that the sum of elements of the softmax vector is equal to 1. Now when we train a neural network, what we're doing is determining a set of weights and biases that make the neural network classify an x and y coordinate into one of these spirals. During the training process, the neural network looks at a bunch of these data points and learns from them to determine these weights and biases. To illustrate a trained neural network, let's look at the decision boundaries on the input space. In order to classify our input space, we're going to have to identify regions where the points will be associated with a particular color. For instance, when I pass this point through the neural network, it comes out as yellow, which is expected since it's close to the yellow spiral. So, if I do this for all points on the neural network, it divides the input space into five different spirals. The next question is, what even is the neural network doing that allows it to model this nonlinear decision boundary? To visualize this, we're going to have to tweak our neural network a little bit. Let's break apart the neural network right before the final layer and add a hidden layer with two neurons. What this allows us to do is visualize a transformation from the input space to the second last layer, which are both in R squared. And what we see, in my opinion, is beautiful. The original dataset isn't linearly separable by any means, but the neural network performs some nonlinear transformation that transforms the dataset into something that is linearly separable. Looking at the decision boundaries in this output space, notice how it's just straight lines separating the dataset. And this is what a neural network does under the hood. It takes in some complex dataset and clusters up similar points such that the second last layer is linearly separable. Then the final layer is a matter of separating these linearly separable points into distinct boundaries. Let's go back to the input space now. Here, you can see the decision boundaries separate the plane into distinct spirals that model the original dataset. However, it gets a little bit more complicated once we move outside the initial training region. Here, we've used ReLU for the activation function of the hidden layers. If you remember, ReLU, or Rectified Linear Unit, is essentially y is equal to 0 for negative numbers and y is equal to x for positive numbers. Programmatically, we can write this as max of x comma 0. Given that we're using ReLU for the hidden layers, the neural network will linearly extend these decision boundaries. Let me be clear, the neural network is not extrapolating anything. Extrapolation would mean extending the pattern given by the input data beyond the input domain. It could look something like this, with the spirals curving beyond the input data. What we're currently doing is just linearly extending the decision boundaries. For these visualizations, I'm simply inputting out-of-domain data to explore and probe and demonstrate the behavior of neural networks. If I were to change the activation function to sine of x, we would expect some sort of periodic behavior. And this is the case. Take a look at the decision boundaries for a neural network trained with sine of x as the hidden activation function. Notice for the input domain, the decision boundaries match up with our original data. What this tells us is that the neural network was able to learn the input data to a pretty high accuracy. But once we look at the out-of-domain boundaries, they are completely different from our ReLU case, with some elements of periodic behavior. Sinusoids have been largely ignored as activation functions in the deep learning space, but they've seen a couple papers describing their applications, which I've linked below if you're interested. Back to the neural network. I want to show how we can visualize the probabilities for each color. Before I show it though, I want to make it clear what exactly we're graphing. Let's go back to the diagram for the 2, 100, 2, 5 neural network. If we look at the top neuron in the final layer, we know its value is the first element of softmax of wx plus p, which we can write out as softmax of w1x1 plus w2x2 plus b1. Here, w1 is the first column of the weight matrix 
W2 is the second column of the weight matrix, X1 and X2 are the first and second neurons of the second last layer of the neural network, and the subscript 1 refers to the first index of the softmax vector. But for now, let's just consider the equation without softmax. If we consider the value of the first neuron, we can write it out using the equation W11x1 plus W12x2 plus B1, where W11 and W12 are the first and second elements of the first row of the weight matrix, and B1 is the first element of the bias vector. This is essentially an equation for a plane. So, let's set the x and y coordinates to be the input values of the second last layer of our neural network, and the value of the red neurons without softmax applied on the z-axis. I've also plotted the label points from the transformation I showed you before. Now, we expect the resulting surface to be a plane, which looks like this. For simplicity, I'm only going to plot the positive portion of this plane. What I want to consider is the maximum of the red plane and the yellow plane. It looks like this. I've used color to signify which parts of the surface have a yellow maximum and which portions have a red maximum. Likewise, let me do the same thing with green, blue, and purple sequentially. Feel free to pause and reflect on what's being shown. This is our final plane. Each point in the plane represents the maximum value the neural network outputted out of the five neurons, along with the corresponding color that had its maximum value. So if I were to show you the plane from the top, it's just our decision boundaries from the previous animation. Now, let me show you what the softmax surfaces look like. Remember, softmax is a smoother version of the argmax function, which allows each number to be represented as a probability. So the first neuron would represent the probability that this number is red. The red surface looks like this. Notice the bump around where the inputs correspond to red. This indicates a high probability that the input point is red. Let me plot each of the five colors sequentially. Once again, feel free to pause and reflect. If I were to plot every color surface, it looks like this. From this angle, it kind of looks like a mess, but if I were to show it from the top, the maximum values divide the surface into five distinct boundaries. If you want to play around with these, the code is on my GitHub page. Manim, the tool I use for these videos made by Grant Sanderson or 3Blue1Brown, has had a pretty substantial increase in performance and ease of use over the years, and the current version even allows for interactability. Before I end the video, let's take a look at this transformation on handwritten digits. This wonderful interactive article on distill.pub has a tool that shows a couple of handwritten digits going through a neural network. Notice how the neural network performs operations to eventually separate the digits into clumps, which are easily separable. I was helped in the creation of this video by Alfredo Canziani and Jan LeCun. Alfredo posts his lectures on his YouTube channel, and they're a great way to rigorously learn the concepts I teach in these videos. Check them out if you're interested. And a huge thanks to everyone supporting me on Patreon. Thanks for watching.